just to recap uh, I highlighted to you how a structured question in this case a question published in an article concerning the protocol of a systematic review that evaluated tests uh, for their uh, accuracy in prediction a particular outcome in a particular population and i emphasize to you that the purpose of this second step in systematic review is to produce the following uh, efforts and outputs <clears throat> the search term combination uh, using and and or correctly to describe the search strategy this is best done by including an appendix that includes the search term combination it's also considered a good practice uh, to include a list of excluded studies giving the reason as to why they were excluded this can be presented as an appendix and figure one which is a flow chart of the study selection and then some assessment of the risk of publication and related biases and i demonstrated to you how funnel plot may be created and its asymmetry assessed i'm going to briefly go over this one more time to ensure that you've picked this up correctly and uh, i demonstrated to you how point estimate of odds ratio is calculated and then from this point estimate uh, i plotted it on what is called a forest plot where we have a scale So I wanted to explain to you once again how uh, effect size was used to evaluate the risk of publication bias. Uh, uh, so this forest plot has a scale where one shows no effect. In this example where pregnancy was the outcome measure, the value above one shows an effect in favor of intervention and values less than one show uh, no effect of the intervention. And here is our point estimate of three that we calculated and its confidence interval, which reflects the sample size of the study. And here they pay maybe another study in this topic, which is larger. So you can see that its effect size uh, is possibly in, in this particular example, the same, but because of its size, the confidence interval is smaller. And there are possibly two other studies where the point estimate in one case is less than one. The other case is much greater than three. So this study shows much greater effect. This one shows no effect. Which of these two studies is likely to be missing from the literature? search would you like to hazard a guess so esther says a negative study is likely to be missing And I presume you say it is missing because it is negative. So perhaps the authors are less motivated to write it up, are less motivated to submit it, and the editors are less likely to recommend it for publication. Okay, so given that this risk of missing studies exists, we can capture this by an analysis called funnel plot analysis, where we plot effect size versus a measure of study size 
and we expect that the smaller studies will be distributed on both sides of the larger studies. And this plot is called symmetrical. Where the studies are missing, this is called asymmetrical. And uh, with this, we have an assessment of what is the possibility that we have some missing studies. So having done this, the next step in systematic review is for us to evaluate the quality of the studies. So the quality assessment of uh, of the included studies is what shows us what really the literature is about in terms of its worth. And by quality, we mean that the study is free of bias, that it is internally valid, that it does not have any systematic error. And design-related bias is assessed by a hierarchy of evidence. And bias in conduct and analysis is assessed by applying a detailed assessment using an existing checklist or adapting one for our own review. And this type of evaluation ought to be presented in the form of a table, possibly with a figure, and subsequently in meta analysis may be used in subgroup analysis and meta regression and finally in making inferences at the time of writing the discussion so the key thing that we see in this figure are the various lists of flaws that can exist in published literature and lack of blinding or lack of control group for example is highlighted here and lack of control group is captured here where we highlight that case series without control group are at the bottom of the hierarchy of evidence and randomization uh, is at the top of the hierarchy of evidence. Uh, and in between our non-randomized studies where control groups exist. Uh, so, at the time of making selection criteria for our step two in a systematic review, we could state at the beginning that we will only include studies with randomized design, or we will only include studies with uh, a control group, we will exclude studies with case series. So this type of um, threshold for study selection can be based on uh, this hierarchy of evidence. Now, when it comes to making a detailed assessment of the study, we need to go back to look at the study design uh, in terms of its flow as described earlier by way of participants, interventions, and outcomes. Goes without saying that we expect the sample to be representative in order for the results or effect size obtained to be generalizable. But this is an element of external validity, not internal validity. For internal validity, we are looking at elements like the ones described here called selection bias, performance bias, or measurement bias. So selection bias creates groups that may not be use of randomization. And another way to deal with this problem in observational studies is to undertake multivariable analysis that, that controls for the confounding effect of differences between groups. With respect to performance bias, we are looking at whether the groups constituted at the beginning of a study 
were treated differently in ways other than the assigned intervention and control. And this problem is prevented by blinding both uh, the participants and the carers. The third problem of measurement bias is captured by uh, the by problems that may arise in classification of the outcome. And this problem is prevented by using blind did outcome assessors. But also we can use outcomes that are objective so that subjectivity does not play a role and the absence of blinding may not in this case uh, adversely affect measurement. And finally is uh, attrition bias which refers to, to losses to follow up affecting the estimation of the effect size. So if studies are not blinded, they tend to produce an effect size larger than in studies that are blinded. This means that we get an impression that intervention is more effective if there is lack of blinding. Here are some things that we look for in a detailed quality assessment uh, at various steps of data extraction with respect to the internal validity assessment or quality assessment of the selected studies. And this is how we tabulate our findings. The table, for example, here, assessment of randomization described as present or absent with one or zero as being uh, the, 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 the score. And if the study has blind as concealment of randomization in, in addition to correct uh, method of generating randomization sequence is given an additional point. On the other hand, a point is deducted if there is no concealment of randomization. Similarly, double blinding now captures performance bias and measurement bias, and it can be scored. And withdrawals and dropouts capture attrition bias. And out of a total of five, we can have a score, and using a threshold of three, we can say that the study has high or low quality. So I'm going to just stop here for a moment and see if colleagues have any questions. Do, do I take it that it's all to proceed to the next stage, which is to think about how this info. Oh, suddenly we have a couple of questions. So my Marcia says it's clear. Uh, Esther has no problem, Eva uh, similarly has all clear. So thank you three of you for confirming that uh, this was clear. So one way of presenting information concerning quality is to tabulate in this manner as you see here. Another way to present the same information is to create a figure, especially if you have studies with more than one designs included. So in this review, 
We have K cohort studies as well as case, as cross-sectional studies present. And the checklist for assessing the quality of these type of studies is, is slightly different from each other. So here we can see that a graph can be used to demonstrate which studies score yes or on various items and which studies don't score anything on that item. And then using all of this information, how many studies overall have good quality uh, amongst cohort studies and uh, among cross-sectional studies.